Hello, I'm Carla, and welcome to episode 72 of There Might Be Cupcakes. What's your motivation, Heather? <laughs> this title comes from one of my favorite scenes in the found footage horror movie, The Blair Witch Project. When Joshua takes Heather's beloved camera from her and starts tormenting her with it, saying, What's your motivation, Heather? You're lost in the woods. You're hungry. You're scared. A witch is chasing you. What's your motivation? I'm paraphrasing, but you get it. It's a funny but rather brutal scene because it's mean. Because they're all exhausted and starving and they're lost. And because Heather does not like to be in front of the camera. She feels safe capturing the world, not being in it live. That last part made it the perfect title for this episode on not only the subgenre of found footage horror, but its own subgenre, internet horror. The subgenre of internet horror feels really new, but actually, as far as I can tell, it goes back to at least as far as 2002 to Halloween Resurrection, in which a reality show streams a group of young adults spending the night in Michael Myers' childhood home, which everyone should have known was a dumb idea. And spoiler alert, it was. Don't tempt the boogeyman, y'all. He gets cranky. Found footage horror is where the story is told through the character's own cameras and photographs, and internet horror is where the story is told through the character's own computers. The creativity comes in found footage in explaining why the characters are filming and on the net. For example, in the groundbreaking Blair Witch Project, Heather Donahue is taping a film school project on an urban legend that crisscrosses with local history on a weekend camping trip that was signed off by her college. In Paranormal Activity 2, the footage comes from the Ray family's installed security cameras, and so on. I've decided that there are two types of internet horror movies and found footage horror movies. I've decided that there are two types of found footage and internet horror movies. The immersive type, where the movie takes place entirely in the characters' computers and phones, on the internet, so to speak, and in their cameras. There's no traditional external footage filmed, like a normal movie. And the second is the internet and found footage as plot point type, where the internet and the character's film footage is used to advance or begin the story in a significant way. And I will review different films of each type that work. Every film on this list, I gave a really high rating. You know me, I'm a film geek as much as a book geek, especially horror genre. There are significant pros and cons to this subgenre of horror. Pros. Our familiarity and comfort with our digital world and our cameras. The expansion of imagination. For example, if hacking is a plot point, the possibilities are almost limitless in a sense. The extra sense of deep immersion for the viewer, if you, especially if you watch the movie on your laptop or on your tablet or phone. The room for writers and directors to add in extra details about the characters. For example, with their Spotify playlist, their laptop background, and other little details about their digital lives in order to progress the scary story. Cons. The loss of those little digital details of watching those movies on your TV. It can be hard to read those screen details and keep up with the action. Little details are lost. And these movies tend to have this obsessive little details in the backgrounds, like searching, which I'll talk about later. I don't have this complaint, but I've seen fans say that these movies start to feel similar and even derivative. And shaky cam. I remember when the Blair Witch Project came out in 1999, people got nauseated. This has never bothered me, which is odd because I have pots. But when a character is filming, for it to be natural, it's not going to be steady cam. And that bothers a lot of people. And all of these, the derivative complaint is the reason I decided to defi define their themes in this episode as how I see it. And how these films explore these themes differently in hopes that y'all might see them in a different light. And get excited about the sometimes gritty and more realistic feeling horror films. Because of the nature of our current internet culture, the nature of photography, just think about paparazzi for instance, and human nature itself. Several themes do repeat throughout this subgenre, and these are the ones that I picked out personally. Obsession, trespass, privacy and the right to information, identity and the nature of identity, seeing what should not be seen, dangerous friends, the paranormal, religion, and urban legends. Now, under urban legends is also included legend tripping. Legend tripping is a form of exploring where you research an idea, a historical event, which usually turns out to be a creepy or unsolved one, a crime or a haunting, and then you physically go and explore that area where it happened, recording your exploration with photos and videos. 
think, again, the Blair Witch Project. Creepypastas have picked up on these real, this real-world pastime of legend tripping and created some truly eerie, creative written stories. The most famous and most effective, in my opinion, as the one most similar to a found footage horror movie script, is Ted the Caver. And that's caver like going caving, spelunking. I wanted to read it for you in this episode, but it's been marked as copyrighted. Darn it. I have instead linked to its wiki page and its website in the show notes. I apologize for the clicking noise you hear right now. Uh, Arlo, the staffy pit, has decided to pace. Sometimes when I talk for my podcast, he gets a little anxious. I think he thinks I'm talking to myself. So you will hear this clicking that might sound like somebody's typing in the distance. It's just Arlo pacing to make sure I'm safe. I apologize. Uh, Everybody say, hey, Arlo. And yes, he's named for Arlo Guthrie, the singer. Um, <laughs> anyway, Ted the, Ge- Ted the Caver. Ted the Caver is a well-crafted story told in the first person about an amateur caver that discovers an unusual hole where one wasn't before, which you know isn't ever good, and is told in increments with creepy pictures as Ted goes deeper and deeper into this forbidding cave. As you continue to read it, you know Ted should not be doing this, and that, and he finds out that other people have done so and might not have returned, and so it builds this lovely feeling of dread. For those of you who do not know, a creepypasta is a fictional scary story shared online, either on Reddit or in the, on the Creepypasta Wiki, which is included in the show notes. The best creepypasta-related subreddits are No Sleep, Creepy Gaming, and the official Creepypasta subreddit. All are linked in the show notes and will be linked to this episode's website entry. The name Creepypasta is a spoonerism of copy-paste, alluding to the viral sharing of these scary stories. They are the 21st century version of urban legends, but they are deliberately created and crafted, just like the infamous Slender Man. Slender Man's Creepypasta page is also linked in the show notes and will be included on the website entry. Slender Man, perfectly for this episode, actually started with two created photographs. I won't read one of his creepypasta entries in this episode because, just like Candyman, the ultimate horror movie urban legend, once you know about Slender Man, he knows about you. And you don't want that. As for found footage horror films, this is where my beloved letterbox comes in very handy. As you know from this podcast and from its Twitter, I'm an avid user and advocate, and this is why. All I had to do was go to my account, which is linked in the show notes and the feeds on the website, Feel free to follow me, and I'll happily follow you back. My username is Claradox, or you can search for the podcast name on the site and find me. And search for the tag Found Footage, which brought up every movie I've watched so far that I've tagged that way. The same goes for the tag Internet Horror, with qualifications. Some of these things are not like the other, as Sesame Street taught my generation. Some of these things are not like the other. Some of these things don't belong. These things are also in the show notes. These show notes are going to be chock-a-block. If you open that page on Letterboxd, either one of the tags, look to the upper right, and you can sort the movies that I listed by their my highest rating, the average highest rating, or film popularity, which is the number of people viewing it and adding it to their watch list or having watched it. Isn't that nifty stuff for a movie geek? It's really cool. Oh, and by the way, my um, username Claradox is my best friend's nickname for me because my name Carla anagrams to Clara. Isn't that cool? Uh, (laughs) I'm so weird, but that makes a good podcaster, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, for this episode, I went through these two tags of mine, and I chose 37 films that I had rated the highest. And then out of those came seven series that were all found footage from my high, and those were all, like I said, from my very highest rated And by coincidence, all of the found footage movie series that I chose fall under my immersion category. All right, so first, the immersion. First, the immersion category. As I said, for some people, these films might be better experienced on a device such as a laptop or a tablet, especially ones involved with the internet. I'll highlight those. I sometimes have blurry vision and sensory processing issues due to Errol Stanlow's fibromyalgia and POTS. And so doing so sometimes helps when important internet or other textual details are involved. But your mileage may vary. All right, note. I will describe every one of these films so that you understand what's going on. There will be no spoilers. So you can chill out, drink your beverage of choice, and enjoy this episode. Because I'm so hoping you will enjoy some or all of them this spooky season. And I don't want to ruin them. So, let's have fun. In the immersion category of found footage, I'm starting with the OG. 
and one of my very favorites, The Blair Witch Project, 1999. I am not doing the math and looking back to how far long ago that was, because that was just a couple of years ago, so leave me alone. A film student... <laughs> A film student, Heather, decides to do a project on a local Maryland legend and ropes in two of her fellow college students, Josh and Michael, into filming for the weekend in the area of the legend. No one gets lost in America. It's too developed, right? This is my home, which I am leaving the comforts of for the weekend to explore the Blair Witch. I can see you. I'm real excited about this. Thank you for I'm the opportunity. I'm very glad. This area's been haunted by that old woman for oh, years. Yeah. I don't know why you have to have every conversation on video. Because we're making a documentary. Not about us getting lost. We're making a documentary about a witch. We're I don't. lost. Admit that first. No, I know we're not lost. They're all over the place. But how do we know it was people? Well, even if it wasn't, I'm not going to play with that either. One thing I love about this movie is that huge parts of it were fully improvised. Just think about that. That's right. Almost no script. It was outlined, and then the three of them were told where to hike, and then they each found notes personalized for them on what to do next. Some of the townspeople in the beginning were real, and some were planted actors to further the story. I cannot describe to you how disturbing this film was when it came out. The ad campaign was so intense. We really thought these kids were missing. I saw it in a small old theater in Norfolk, Virginia, The really old-fashioned kind with red velvet curtains and red velvet seats. I felt weird and out of place when it was over. My husband and I didn't want to go home afterwards. We went to this little coffee shop and we sat awkwardly staring off into the middle distance, not talking. I highly recommend watching the two mockumentaries that accompany it and that were created to further the idea that this movie was real. They're brilliant. And that Heather, Josh, and Michael were really missing. They're called Curse of the Blair Witch and Shadow of the Blair Witch. They are quite well done and extremely immersive. And I have to tell you a story on my mom. You know, I've talked about my mom on the podcast before. I gotta love her. Love you, mama. I told it the other day on Reddit and was applauded. I showed my mom this movie when she visited, probably 2000, maybe the next year, when she visited us. And when the movie was over, she turned to me with big, wide eyes and said, we have to find them. (laughs) One of my best horror stories ever. Okay, I also recommend the rest of the series, though not everybody's a fan. I absolutely love them. They are Blair Witch 2 Book of Shadows from 2000 and Blair Witch 2016. Last summer, after the crowds left, five strangers returned to the woods to uncover the truth. But one of them has a secret that will unlock the curse. Now, if you don't believe in the Blair Witch, then why the hell did you bother to come? I thought the movie was cool. This fall... Just in time for Halloween, the witch is back. What is that? The guy who uploaded this video said it was from a tape he found in the Black Hills woods. I think that might be my sister. You really think your sister could still be out there after all these years? If there is any chance that I could find out what happened to her, I need to try. Legend said there's been a curse on these woods. Do you believe in the stories about the Blair Witch? I think they do a marvelous job expanding upon the mythology of the witch, Ellie Kedward, and the idea of legend tripping that's built into the first movie. The themes of this series are urban legend, identity, seeing what should not be seen, trespass, obsession, dangerous friends, the paranormal, and religion. Basically, all of them. I'm fascinated with the theme of time that's built into the paranormal throughout this series. The first movie in particular is so intelligent in its use of time and so generous with this and its assumption that its audience is is intelligent and deeply engrossed in paying attention. The two mockumentaries go deeper into this and flesh out the details. The second series 
under the immersion category under found, found footage, which also includes the internet and some of its entries, is the Paranormal Activity series. You know I had to go there. It began with a bang, much like the original Blair Witch Project, with Paranormal Activity in 2007, which of course was a couple of years ago as well. Don't, don't at me. <laughs> Katie and Micah believe their house is haunted. Very simple premise. Mike, Mika, I always want to say Micah, but it's Mika. Mika, who loves technology, buys a bunch of expensive cameras, both handheld and mounted, and begins to follow Katie around and film both of them while they sleep, all to Katie's chagrin. She wants her privacy, and she does not want evidence. She wants to ignore what's happening in her house. That's the premise. It's so simple. And yet, it's terrifying. In the sequels 2 in 2010, 3 in 2011, 4 in 2012, and The Ghost Dimension in 2015, the best I can say without spoilers is that we learn why Katie wants to ignore what happen- what's happening. Ooh, that was a difficult spoiler squeeze right there. I hope you're proud of me. There are two spin-offs, The Marked Ones in 2014 and Tokyo Night in 2010, which take the hauntings to a Latinx neighborhood and Japan, respectively. And yes, they are related. They sound like money grabs, I know, but they are directly related. A future sequel, Next of Kin, has been slated for this year, but still has no new information in Letterbox as of this episode. These movies are legitimately terrifying. I can understand, after hearing me rattle off their sequels, especially with their unimaginative names, Paranormal Activity 3, Paranormal Activity 4, that one might have some pause and think that they are typical money grab horror movies. They aren't. They're multi-layered story-building ghost stories about a haunted family that may be participating in their own haunting. I have screamed out loud in public theaters watching them, along with everybody else. The original is one of my favorite horror movies. The themes in the series are identity, trespass, definitely dangerous friends, the paranormal, and religion. Although the internet is incorporated into several of these, the internet itself is a plot point and not immersive. The next series in the immersive category of found footage is The Last Exorcism 2010 and The Last Exorcism 2 2013. The Last Exorcism completely blew me away with its storytelling and originality first time I saw it, and it sucks me in every time I watch it. I'm so grateful for the sequel because I wanted more. Basically, a charismatic preacher who has lost his faith is called out to a rural farm to exercise a young, innocent girl, Nell. Those toenails were Ellie. (laughs) Everybody say hi, Ellie. Anyway, preacher is doing it for the money and the pizzazz because he is a bit of a narcissist more than a bit actually but do not ask the devil to dance because he might say yes Whew, that was a hard one not to spoil as well be proud of me the first one is so unnerving it has this one scene that turns simply counting to three into something ugh, it will make your skin crawl no hyperbole i felt uncomfortable just saying that This movie really makes you feel like you're watching the documentary it's set up to be, and you feel like you almost should not be watching it in the best way. These two movies have themes or identity, but not the way you might think. Trespass, Dangerous Friends, The Paranormal, and Religion. As you know, I love the subgenre of religious horror, and this is the best melding of religious horror and found footage. Exorcism is alive and well. The Bible is filled with demons. If you believe in God, you have to believe in the devil. Somehow, the devil kind of entered. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Nothing to be nervous about. Where is now? In the fire. And this makes 13 on my list, which is so appropriate. Hail Satan. <laughs> 14 and 15 are two of the most disturbing, at least for me on my list, in the best way. Creep and Creep 2. Oh my god. 2014 to 2017. They are both completely carried by the brilliant Mark Duplass, who also produced them and wrote their scripts. Alright, this is the no spoiler description. Someone answers an ad for a videographer for the day 
and goes to the stranger's house to film him for the entire day for posterity. And we watch that film. These are two of my favorite horror movies. And just like The Blair Witch Project, the original creep made me feel weird afterwards. Like I wasn't sure if I wanted to hug or I wanted to get away from all humanity for a while. So much fun. I released something watching these two movies, which is arguably one of the purposes of horror. These two films are deeply wrapped up in the themes of identity and obsession. The second in Trespass as well. One mini spoiler, but not really. Doesn't spoil the plot. The second one has the most unabashed, strange, uncomfortable, and longest male frontal nudity in any horror movie, and I will take a bet on that. Yes, that means you get to see all of Mark Duplass. All of him. For a long time. (laughs) But it's not fun. Not that he's a handsome man. I adore him. But that scene is not right. And you'll see what I mean. Don't hook up for jobs on Craigslist that involve going to strangers' homes. Life lessons from horror movies. And from me. Don't do it. I'm obsessed with this next movie because it's probably the closest we're going to get to a female Indiana Jones. Probably ever. As Above, So Below from 2014. Scarlett, a genius PhD professor in symbology, history, all the things that fascinate me, is trying to find the Philosopher's Stone for personal reasons and finds her way into the Paris catacombs. If you don't know, these are massive and partially unmapped tunnels underneath the city of Paris that contain over six million bodies. Well, bones now. Over six million skeletons. As a forensic anthropology postgraduate student, I was in charge of one skeleton, and the aura, the energy of that deceased person in the room was intense. When I held my first skull in that class on the first day, I'm not ashamed to admit that after class I went in the bathroom and cried. There is something about that, about skeleton parts that used to be a human They used to think and move. It's intense. And these tunnels and walls and rooms that are just covered in people. It's unbelievable when you see this movie. Imagine over six million. The tunnels are created as an ossuary because the city cemeteries were overflowing. There's a tiny portion of them that are open to tours to the public. The rest are forbidden for reasons of safety and respect. The movie makers were allowed to film in part of the real catacombs, making this one of the more claustrophobic yet eerily beautiful horror movies ever. The catacombs official website is in the show notes and will be in the web- website episode entry. And if any of y'all actually ever take the tour, I want to hear about it, please. This movie has intense themes of identity, seeing what should not be seen, trespass, obsession, urban legends, dangerous friends, the paranormal and religion, basically all of them and would be an excellent double feature with the Blair Witch Project. This one presses hard on the theme of dangerous friends in a really intriguing way. I might rewatch it once I complete this episode. That's how much I love it. It makes me want to read esoteric books and write in leather-bound journals. If I were to name one dark academia-themed horror movie just off the top of my head, this will be it. The next series on my list is The House's October Built. And this is a little complicated, bear with me. The first one came out in 2014, and its sequel was in 2017. Now, the 2014 is a remake by all of the original people involved of the 2011 movie, which I have not seen. You with me? I know that's a little confusing, but keep bearing with me. The original is available on Amazon. I will eventually check it out, but seeing that the filmmakers weren't happy with it to the point of reshooting it, and that I love the remake, I'm not in a hurry. Let me know if you watch both first versions, what what you think. Let me know if you watch both first versions, what you think. Also, another disclaimer. I was told before I watched the sequel by someone online that it, quote, ruined, number one, by, quote, changing the story with the sequel. I can see what that fan meant, though I disagree. Basically, and bear with me again, if you only watch the first one, you think something awful thing one happened. You're left with a gut punch at the very end. But if you watch the sequel, it continues the story. 
you realize that awful thing one didn't happen the way you thought, but something dire thing two does happen. So it really just depends about how you feel about the ending of the first movie. Have I truly confused you yet? I'm sorry. Anyway, non-spoiler synopsis. A group of friends who really, really love Halloween go on a haunted house hunt and film the whole thing, picking up stalkers along the way. When I say haunted house, I don't mean the put your hand in a bowl of grapes and pretend it's eyeballs church group type of haunted house. I mean the extreme haunt type where you sign a waiver and the haunt actors can put their hands on you. The kind I'm never going to do. Ever. These kids are on the hunt for the more extreme, the better. Tell me about yourself and what are we doing? You want my name? My name is Zach. You've known me for 20 years, Mikey. I rented an RV. I want to find the most extreme haunted house in the world. What is an extreme haunt? I don't understand how far, like how far they, you really can go on without hurting somebody. What's your name, buddy? <laughs> Hi, Mikey. What's the camera for? Are you doing, doing crime stuff with your cops or something? We're doing to catch a predator. To catch a predator? We're gonna go. You wanna be a pretty dog? Be like me. What's going on? Do you care if we ask you some questions? I'm with all this group of people and we're trying to find something extreme. Hey, we got it. It's in Louisiana this year. We don't have an address though. <laughs> this is where they said to go. Is that the girl from the haunt? She didn't really say anything. Something happened to your car? Look what we have here. It's an invitation. This is not a haunt. We're in the middle of nowhere in our RV. Yeah, I know. That's what we've been wanting. One more day. It's Halloween. We go home tomorrow. Hey, wait up! Wait up! What's that? Shh. Somebody's on the roof. What's just up? Brandy, stay back. Look into the abyss and it's looking at you. Am I right? My great grandpa always told me to be careful what you ask for. And I listened to him. The themes in this two, these two movies are seeing what should not be seen. Obsession, dangerous friends, and urban legends. Then I come to the first internet immersion movies. Where the entire found footage movies take place in the internet. Number 19, Unfriended, 2014. And its sequel, number 20, Unfriended Dark Web, 2018. We, these two films are not related. There are no similar characters in either one. We spend the entire films inside a group video chat with friends and with uninvited guests. Think Zoom horror. That's the best I can do without spoiling them. Even though these were both made before the pandemic, they definitely hit differently now, and I kind of suggest watching them now. As I said before, since these are immersive internet horror movies, there's clues in what songs the character controlling the computer is playing, what private messages and emails he and she send. There's a lot going on for the entire movie, just boom, 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 boom. If you have better vision than I, go ahead and watch it on your TV. But there's also fun immersion watching it on your computer or tablet, it kind of feels like it's happening in, in your device. The second movie, as you might guess from its subtitle, plays with legends and rumors around the dark web and what could be obtained there. Hint, Hostile. I watched Unfriended 2 on DVD from Redbox and so was able to watch alternative endings and so can tell you I much preferred one of the alternate endings to the original. This series' themes are naturally identity, seeing what should not be seen, privacy and the right to information, Dangerous Friends, Urban Legends in the second one, and The Paranormal in the first one. The last movies and series under found footage immersion is one of my favorites, and it really doesn't seem to be well known at all, so sit back and let me evangelize. It's Hell House LLC, as in a corporation. I get spooked just thinking about this series. That's how good it is. I love it, and I squeeze it, and I got it George. The first one came out in 2015. 
Hell House to the Abaddon Hotel in 2018, and Hell House LLC 3 Lake of Fire in 2019. These movies are terrifying, and it doesn't matter how many times I've seen them, they scare me every time. A group of friends have made a business out of haunts, just like the houses that October built. Every year, they have set up a haunted house, they hire a couple of extra actors, and they have a blast together in New York City. That's the prequel, the -the behind-the-scenes story. Hell House LLC is the name of their haunt company. They decide to move out of New York and upstate to the small town of Abaddon to repurpose the abandoned Abaddon Hotel into their next big haunt attraction. Then something awful happened that first night, and almost all of them disappeared. The first movie uses their footage. They've always taped everything they did during setup as a tradition to learn from it each year and improve. As well as news footage, haunt goers footage, as well as interviews with the one remaining member to find out what happened. Then the movies continue the story with the hotel becoming a dangerous urban legend for legend trippers and an attraction for ambitious news reporters and on and on. I am not exaggerating with how real these movies seem and frightening these movies are. They are done as well as the Blair Witch mockumentaries. I have had nightmares about them. I mean that as a compliment. What happened that night at the Abaddon Hotel? What is that? It's everything. Sarah, have you watched those? How beautiful is this? Hell House. Wait, 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 wait. There it is, there it is, there it is. There we go. What was that? I don't know. You have heard the rumors about this. There are no rumors about about this place. No rumors. We talked about this. It's supposed to be haunted. All right, dude, lock me in. Hold it. Gas speed. It was when we started sleeping there that things started to change. Back. You hear that, right? I'm telling you, we have to call it off right now. We have no business being here. Alex is more confident than ever. If you're an etymology nerd like me, you might have noticed something about these movies already, hint hint. I'll stop there. You must see these films and I can't spoil too much. But warning, if you have a phobia of clowns, you will not like these movies. The themes in this series are seeing what should not be seen, trespass, obsession, dangerous friends, the paranormal, and religion in the third movie. The one caveat also, besides the clowns, is that a lot of people have problems with the religion in the third movie, but I think it goes very well with the other two movies. Let me know what you think. Now we move to the second category. Found footage is a plot point which means the entire movie isn't from the point of view of a character, character's cameras, or previously filmed footage, only part of it. The first on my list is, I think I'm pronouncing this right, please correct me, Norai. Norai? Norai the Curse, a Japanese horror movie from 2005. A documentary filmmaker and paranormal author is exploring what seem to be a large number of unrelated odd events and deaths that are only tied together by the name of a demon that's included somehow. Its themes are seeing what should not be seen, the paranormal, and religion. I will probably also be re-watching this one after I record. It left me with this strange after effect after I watched it. Almost that feeling like you've forgotten something you meant to do or something you meant to tell someone, that haunted back of your mind, tip of the tongue feeling, which I don't think any other movie has left me with. It's really intriguing. It's an entire mood. It really is. The next is the roughest watch on this list, and I don't recommend it for just anyone, really for not many people, but it is so well made that I had to include it. I had trouble finishing it, and I I had trouble finishing it, And I only did so out of sheer fascination. It's the Poughkeepsie Tapes from 2007. And it's a doozy. It's the most violent one on either list. The found footage moments in this movie are set up as a serial killer's home movies. And they look extremely real and gritty. Think Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Which, by the way, I didn't have the nerve to finish. I didn't 
ironically make it past the whole movie. <laughs> um, the Poughkeepsie tape shows up all the time on those extreme horror movies, and horror fans couldn't finish these, and scariest horror movie list on the internet, you know, by BuzzFeed and Bustle and all those. But don't think it's a weird underground push too far for too far sake film. It debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival. It's basically fake snuff films tied together with interviews and investigations and hunting for the serial killer in question. Imagine an unedited Law & Order SVU episode if they could just go for it. You watch people being murdered. I, I can't be more blunt. It's extremely skilled. It's very scary. And I, I'm pretty certain I could never watch it again. Bloody Disgusting called it one of the best indie films of 2007 and wrote that it's, quote, scary, creepy, unnerving, bizarre, and very uncomfortable to watch. Its themes include seeing what should not be seen and obsession. The next, Lovely Molly from 2011, is both gorgeous and sad, as well as frightening. Molly moves into her deceased father's home and begins to be haunted. That's the best I can do without spoiling it. It's a slow burn. A beautiful slow burn. It explores identity, the paranormal, and religion. It's really time to rewatch this one again as well. It has a gorgeous autumnal vibe and color scheme. And I always want to write something after I watch it. Then we turn to The Den from 2013. We turn to academia again. As in above, so below. But in this one... Our heroine is actually studying webcam users' behavior. Same academic arrogance as Scarlet's. This girl thinks she's safe in her own apartment bedroom, but are you ever really safe if your web camera is accessible? Here we're talking about seeing what should not be seen, privacy and the right to information, and trespass. Perhaps also obsession. See, that's the thing about the internet. You never really know who's on the other side. Be right back. I'm going to cover my camera. This next one's a favorite of mine that I also really never hear anybody talk about. Devil's Pass, 2013, a.k.a. the Ditloff, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, the Ditloff Pass Incident, directed by Rennie Harlan of A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master. If you're like me and Harriet the Spy and you want to know everything and write it all down, that incident will have rung a bell. The Ditloff Pass Incident is an extremely eerie, real-life, violent, and unexplained incident that occurred to Russian student hikers in February 1959. Even though they were experienced hikers, something happened to them that caused them to flee their tents in the middle of the night in apparent terror. Some died of explained, unexplained hypothermia. By that I mean they had the tools and the wherewithal for that not to happen. Some died of bizarre and as of yet unexplained physical trauma, such as severe head wounds, and removed tongues and eyebrows. Yeah. Well, the premise of this film is that a college student about the same age thinks he knows what happened to those unfortunate Russian students, and he drags his friends with their own specialized skills to the site of the incident to film a documentary. It doesn't go well, which could be the description of every one of these movies. They made plans. It didn't go well. <laughs> The spooky and original movie explores the themes of seeing what should not be seen, trespass, obsession, dangerous friends, urban legends, because at some point this real-life tragedy has in part taken on the life of an urban legend and the paranormal. This next movie surprised me. I watched it because it was directed by one of the creators of the Blair Witch Project, and I ended up screaming out loud a couple of times, even though I was safe in my own home and it was light outside. I was in my own bed. Exist. 2013, directed by Eduardo Sanchez, is about the old horror trope of a group of friends heading to a party cabin in the woods, turned on its head. See, they're in Bigfoot country. I can hear you snickering through my headphones. I know, I know. But seriously, this movie is truly deeply scary. I really did scream out loud more than once. Sanchez's Bigfoot and Exist is no joke. Here we are seeing what should not be seen, because cryptids do not want to be cataloged, y'all. Trespass and urban legends. Don't go to a party cabin in the woods. That's another lesson from horror. I need to do an episode on lesson, life lessons from horror. We can just check them off. Just don't. The Canal, 2014, is another movie I really don't hear anybody talking about. It's an Irish movie about being haunted by your obsessive thoughts. A man thinks he's being cheated on, 
and that there might be something evil in his house as well. Irish horror is quiet and dark and slow, a whole mood and color scheme. And this film explores trespass, privacy, and the right to information, obsession, and the paranormal. The title comes from the canal that stretches along his neighborhood, a forbidding barrier, a constant source of danger for his young son, a source of contagion for his unclean housing project. It's a character in the movie in itself. This next film was an entire moment in the online horror community while we were awaiting it, and for very good reason. It lived up to its hype and then some. I also had a nightmare about this one and was happy to have it because it got my creative juices flowing. The Taking of Deborah Logan from 2014 might be the only horror movie, and please correct me if I'm wrong, to be directly about Alzheimer's disease. Basically, a medical student and her crew have been welcomed for exchange of much-needed funds into the home of Deborah, who is suffering from Alzheimer's, by her very peculiar daughter, who is her caregiver. But all is not as it seems. This movie takes the delightful horror trope, which is so true that other people's houses can be creepy, and runs into the end zone with it, and then just keeps running. For those my age and older, the masterful performance of Deborah Logan is given by the same actress, Jill Larson, who played the eccentric opal, Jenny's mom, on the soap opera All My Children. I'm letting you know so you're not tormented by, who the hell is that? Like I was watching it the first time. <laughs> I never forget anything. Except when brain fog kicks in, and I can't remember what I did yesterday. But I can remember who, who Jenny's mom was. <sighs> I haven't watched all my children in 30 years. Pfft. Such a weirdo. All right. Here we explore the nature of identity, privacy and the right to information, seeing what should not be seen, dangerous friends, trespass and the paranormal, and I freaking love this movie. Oh, watch it. Please watch it. I'm begging you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse my exuberance. We return in directly to the horrors of dementia in M. Night Shyamalan's The Visit 2015. I can hear you groaning. Stay with me. But that's not truly what this movie is about. Two young kids, a brother and a sister, Tyler and Rebecca, go to visit their grandparents for the first time. It's the first time because their mother has been estranged from her parents since before Tyler and Rebecca were born. There's a delightful fairy tale vibe to this horror film, Hansel and Gretel, right down to crawling into an oven. There's an odd hipsterness in the horror community with regards to disliking Shyamalan's movies on principle. I don't understand it. This film is a horrifying roller coaster ride, and it's really well crafted, with humor coming from Tyler just enough to break the tension. The actress playing Nana, Dana Duggan, makes the movie. Her facials stayed with me after the movie ended. I can't be imagine being in alone in a house with her. Someone needs to come check on Nana. Here we have, through the younger brother's ambition to make a documentary, identity, privacy, and the right to information, definitely seeing what should not be seen, and trespass. And perhaps obsession? Yeah, obsession. The next one is Nerve, 2016, with Emma Robert. This one is unusual, and some people might call it a thriller rather than a horror movie, but I consider the concept deeply frightening. Perhaps it's my introversion and my mild agoraphobia talking. Exploring Trespass, it's directed by Henry Joost. I think I'm saying his name right. I apologize. Who also directed part three and four of the Paranormal Activity series. And Ariel Schumann, Catfish Neve's brother, who did alongside him. The basic concept is there's an online game called Nerve, where you take increasingly dangerous dares for money. The deeper you go, the more you might endanger your life, and the more trapped you get. There are serious consequences if you back out, and the whole world is watching and betting. The idea just gives me the wiggins, to paraphrase Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Like I said, it stars Emma Roberts, who you know from American Horror Story and Screen Queens, and it mainly explores the themes of trespass and obsession. We go from outside the internet driven by it to inside the internet driven by it. You'll see what I mean. 2018 Searching literally had me on the edge of my seat. I don't use that phrase lightly, and I, I'm also careful not to do that because it causes me extra pain, and I was all kinds of cramped up when this movie was over. The premise of this movie is so simple. David Kim's daughter Margot is missing, and he learns through her internet life and her iCloud and her email that she was not who th she, he thought she was. The entire beginning of the movie is the growth of the family, 
through their iCloud photos, their email, their text messages to each other. It's just brilliant. You watch this girl grow up, then disappear through the cloud and the internet. The move, this movie takes place on and offline, so that's why it's in this partial found footage list. It looks at themes of identity, seeing what should not be seen, trespass, privacy, and the right to information, and perhaps obsession. And then we go to the last internet movie on this list, Cam, May 2018. Cam is a film about an internet sex worker, created by a sex worker. Exploring themes of identity, seeing what should not be seen, trespass, privacy and the right to information, and the paranormal, it's based on a simple idea. What if you logged on one day and you were already online? What if you logged on to your Cam Girl account and you were already logged in and you were looking at yourself? Ugh. Again, the Wiggins. Same idea as your mirror reflection winking at you, but digital. Ugh. Yuck. Wiggins. Phoenix Forgotten is the eerie and sad movie, and again, one I don't hear people talk about very often. And it made me feel strange the same way the Blair Witch Project did the first time. It's the perfect found footage movie for fans of the X-Files. I believe that the flying saucers are objects from another planet. The Navy planet. has no saucer-shaped aircraft or missile. There's no good reason for keeping this secret for three decades. The government's been lying about UFOs for 50 years. <gasps> what is that? Oh okay. Five, six, seven, right. You guys ever seen anything like this before? <laughs> that's that's one object. But I zoom in on it. Yeah. I'm zooming, Mom. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. That's definitely not a plane. <laughs> what do you think that was? I don't know. They're just cops. Cops don't walk around in the middle of the night with telescopes. The Phoenix lights flew southeast, which is exactly where we're headed. How do we get there? It's like what? six in the morning. This is gonna be red. Literally nothing out here. What well, you Whoa. got? Come look at this. What the hell? I don't like this. May 2017, it's about an event that happened 20 years before. Much like Blair Witch, three teens went exploring and then went missing. And now footage from their exploration has been found. And we're watching it. But this is nothing like the Blair Witch Project. Phoenix is its own thing. It's quote unquote witch is UFO sightings. The film from present day is intermingled from the found footage from the kids' legend tripping, and it really makes you feel like you're watching something real. And the third act of the movie is terrifying. Its themes are seeing what should not be seen, trespass, dangerous friends, the paranormal, and obsession. The final film I chose for today was another sleeper I found hidden on the free service Tubi called Horror in the High Desert, made in 2021. We finish where we started with a missing person who went exploring. This movie also has an actor in it from Blair Witch, in which she played an uncredited Burkittsville villager, and also acts in and does voiceovers for the mockumentaries. She's named here as Tanya Williams Ogden. I'm uncertain of her name used in the Blair Witch properties, because it's apparently not the same. Or like I said, she's a completely uncredited there, I'm not sure. But that is definitely her, unless she has a complete look and sound alike. Help me out if you know, please. The basic plot of horror in the high desert, without spoilers, is that three years ago, an experienced outdoorsman and YouTuber went missing. Now, a documentary is being made about what happened to him using some of his footage from YouTube. And the truth about who he really was and what really happened to him is coming out. It explores the themes of identity, seeing what should not be seen, trespass, dangerous friends, and obsession, much like Blair Witch. Again, my agoraphobia is triggered. The idea of walking three days away from other people, that means that you are three days away from help, that you have to walk three days to return. This reminds me of listening to the, audio, the audiobook of Journey to the Center of the Earth by H.G. Wells, narrated by the glorious Tim Curry. I was in my car, safe and sound, on a sunny day. I felt like I couldn't breathe because I was doing the math, thinking, no, don't dig deeper. That's one more day you'll have to dig out. How much food do you have? How much water do you have? Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> Triggered, y'all. Triggered. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into found footage horror and its own subgenre, internet horror. I hope for those of you that usually shy away from found footage for various reasons that you might try a movie on at least the plot point list, a movie that only uses found footage or the internet for part of the film. I carefully chose these movies, a mix of popular and not well-known films, for my found footage and internet horror tags. I've rated all of these from four to five stars in Letterboxd, the highest ratings. I love all of them unabashedly, 
and I hope you will love some of them too. Remember, the links to these tags are in the show notes and will be in the website entry for you to play with. And please feel free to follow me there on Letterboxd, and I will happily follow you back. It's a fun site. Welcome to spooky season and the colder months, my favorite part of the year. But I'm spooky all year round, y'all know that. I hope I've helped you find a few cupcakes in this episode. Want to let me know some good movies that should be on this list that I missed? Hit me up in the Facebook group, the Reddit group, comment on the Facebook page, tweet at me, comment on Instagram, or email me at Carla at ThereMightBeCupcakes.com, or of course, message me on Letterboxd. All these links are in the show night on the website. One admission I know about is the Rec series and its American remake, Quarantine. I'm not familiar enough with the series yet to include it, having only seen Rec and Quarantine so far, and having gone no farther yet. Alex and Andrea of the Faculty of Horror have done a masterful episode on this series. I've linked to it in the show notes and will link to it in the website entry for this episode. I bow to their expertise. Another movie I realized as I was recording that I left out was the uh, Asian horror movie Lake Mungo. So I will link to it on Letterboxd and on the website entry. I can't believe I left out Lake Mungo. It is a ghost story. The, a family is exploring what happened to their deceased daughter and sister. And it is eerie. And you see things sometimes on the second watch that you didn't see on the first one. Like I said, I will link to it on Letterbox and the website entry. And I can't believe I omitted that. I literally thought of it as I was talking. Um, head slap moment. <laughs> After this episode is published, I will add all of these movies to the There Might Be Cupcakes movie list on Letterboxd, which is linked in the show notes with a link to this episode. This link has every mo- this list has, has every movie I've mentioned in an episode. Or it will. I'm double checking it right now against each episode script. And I will add Lake Mungo to the list as well. As for book suggestion, you know what books come in? Behind the Horror, True Stories That Have Inspired Horror Movies to continue the shivers and the learning. But Dr. Lee Miller, narrated by Adam Sims, 9 hours and 34 minutes of more horror facts for your ears. Just click on the link for it in the show notes to help out the podcast. If you're new to Audible, please just click on the Audible link in the show notes and choose it as your free book. You get to try Audible for free for a month and keep the book even if you cancel. And don't forget, There Might Be Cupcakes has the honor of being selected to be an Audible podcast. Not every podcast does. I got the vapors when I found out. Thank you so much for trusting me, Audible. As well, since I mentioned Candyman, the ultimate created urban legend, the icon of urban legends, you must read the story from whence he came. It's called The Forbidden by Clive Barker, and it's included in Volume 5 of Barker's collected short stories known as the Books of Blood. They're called the Books of Blood because every time we're opened, we're read. (laughs) This volume is published in the United States as In the Flesh because I guess we always have to be different. Re the metric system. (sighs) Anyway. It is also available from Audible and can be chosen as your free book as well. It's narrated by Jeffrey Kaffer, Melissa Exelberth, Scott O'Neill, and Vanessa Hart. If you already have Audible, I've linked it in the show notes as well, and we'll link it in the website entry. The other stories in this collection are The Madonna, Babel's Children, and In the Flesh. Coming back with the third installment in the House of Leaf series, and oh, the verdict on my sinus troubles is that it's neurological in nature. Great. My body only gets weirder, right? So I'm being referred to the University of Virginia neurologist, which is taking a while. So, there's that. My final disability hearing is also in a month, so I'm a bundle of nerves. But that's what horror is for, right? Scream and release. Scream and release. I love you guys. Thanks for helping me find cupcakes. I hope I do the same for you. Oh, and one more thing I I almost forgot. Candyman. Candyman, Candyman, Candyman.